Hello and welcome to another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. My name is Andrew Claudio, a.k.a. GMAC, and it's time to preview another Knicks matchup, this time against the Oklahoma City Thunder, one of the NBA's best stories this season. They come in at 51 and 22 top three or four in net rating uh, coming off a very dominant statement win, I would call it, against uh, old friend Kevin Durant and the Phoenix Suns last night. Uh, the Knicks come in after one of the more thrilling games that they played this year. One of the best performances in franchise history behind Jalen Brunson. 61 points, but it came in an overtime loss to Victor Wembanyama and the San Antonio Spurs. This is the worst Wemby's ever going to be, and he had 40-20-7 and seven last night. So, uh, the Knicks will hopefully look to rebound against the league's uh, a Cinderella story, we'll call it this season. The 51 and 22 Oklahoma City Thunder uh, in a dogfight at the top of the Western Conference. And joining me to talk about this Easter Sunday matchup, uh, a, a man that wears many hats. Uh, the two I'm going to point out is he's the host of Down to Dunk and the Oklahoma City the OKC Dream Team, uh, Mr. Andrew Schleck. Andrew, welcome to the Knicks Film School Podcast. Thanks for having me. Andrew yes. Pod. Yes, it's literally an Andrew Pod today. Andrew Squared. Uh, my goodness, what the Thunder have been this season. Um, I, I mean, I said all the accolades at the top. They are 51 and 22. They are currently, I believe in a three-headed race for the one seed in the West. Yeah, Minnesota is also 51-22. and 22. Somehow Denver has dropped to third, being a half game back. Um, in your wildest expectations, or maybe this is what you thought how this season would go, uh, it, it, how are the vibes in OKC that we're about 75 games through it, and this is where the Thunder fi find themselves? Yeah, I think... Everyone is still a little bit shocked that this is the way it's gone. I mean, I picked them to win 46 games and they're already at 51. I think people thought there would be more of like a smaller jump after last year. I think, you know, they make the play in tournament, they win 40 games. You think, okay, usually it, it you don't go from 40 wins to 50. 5, 57, whatever they're going to win this year, that's very unusual. And so I don't think the expectations were there. Also, this is the second youngest team in the NBA. And young players typically don't win. Young players make mistakes. They don't play defense well. But you can kind of throw all of that out with this team. Like they're, they're very, they're strangely disciplined for a young team. Um, and then the, the vibe around the team is, it feels like a like a college team or like a high school team because these, all these guys are young. They're all just really enjoying like the the process behind you know becoming this team, and a lot of the outside noise hasn't gotten in yet. And I say yet just because it, it's the, this is the NBA. <laughs> you know, it happens to every single team. It's going to happen to this team at some point, but it hasn't happened yet. This is the uh, this is the fun part, is what I tell people on our show. You know, yeah. the ride up, no expectations. You get to have this 50 win young team. Everything is amazing. You're the story. You're one of like the, the big stories of the league. You have an MVP candidate. You have a rookie of the year candidate. You have a coach of the year candidate. You have all these accolades that are before you. And this is the fun part. And I'll say the, the team itself is very much enjoying it. And so, so is the fan base. Yeah, I, I shortchanged them. They're second in net rating in the NBA. And in a normal season, yeah. a 7.3 net rating would be would probably lead the league. That would have been and, the best last year. Yeah. And just there just happens to be one of the greatest regular season teams ever by net rating happening in the Eastern Conference. I think what's impressed me the most with what they've been able to do this year, specifically in that that conference, you know, last year. The Warriors were getting themselves together. The Lakers were figuring their stuff out. The Suns made a big trade. So there was a lot of, from what I perceived, cold water thrown on what Memphis did, what the Kings three seed meant. And it was like, this is a weird year. So I don't know how much, how seriously I take like the, the Kings getting a three seed. The top of the West this year is actually pretty dominant. There's already three 50 win teams at the top. The defending champs have been in defending champ mode since the all-star break and like the, the Timberwolves. And I mean, we'll see what, what happens with cat and what happens with that team in the playoffs, but they haven't really dropped at all. And this young team, like you're talking about has just, 
this just never never dropped at any point it seems and i guess my my curiosity and i was talking about this with uh someone who covers the the magic because to your sentiment of like enjoy this because only thing from here is that expectations are going to come but like the magic i don't see i don't see a path for them to get to the finals like i do see a path for this thunder team just based on talent and what they've done this season to get to the finals so like, what does a disappointing end to this season look like for for the Thunder? If you were like to poll the majority of the fan base, you know, how have expectations changed? I think a, a round one exit would feel disappointing, and some of that will be matchup dependent. But even regardless of that, I think round one losing would feel very disappointing. You guys got to see it last season. The Cleveland Cavaliers mm-hmm. had a I mean, I think a lot of people pick Cleveland to beat the Knicks in round one. Outside of New York, yes, a lot. Almost the majority was people picking. Yeah, Cleveland. yeah. And some of it, the the storylines aren't they're they're dissimilar in a lot of ways, but they are very similar in others. That you know, young team, really good net rating, good offense and defense, and they got manhandled by the Knicks, and it was very disappointing. And it's kind of it, it changed some perception around the Cavs. You know, the Cavs are like this really fun story heading into the playoffs, and now it's like, oh, like what are the Cavs? Yeah. yeah. And so if that happened with the Thunder, I mean, I think a lot of Thunder fans would not want them to play the Lakers. If that happened, they lost to the Lakers in round one. I think definitely people would be like, oh, well, how good are, are these guys really that good? You know, I, so I, I think that that would definitely be disappointing at this point. Any Anything past round one for me is like, they weren't supposed to be here, you know? Kind of yeah. Thing. Yeah. And I, that's very, very rational. Those expectations. I, I wonder, I mean, just the follow up, like do the, does the fan base share that, that it's like, I didn't expect them to win 50 games, let alone have yeah. like home court in the first round. So they get to a second round and lose to, you know, whomever I, I'm assuming the nuggets are, yeah, maybe the Clippers or even the, the maybe the Magic make a run that it's still like a, a, a successful season. I think so. I mean, right now, if it ended this way and Minnesota's at the top, Thunder two, Denver three, yeah, losing to the Nuggets in round two, I think you can feel okay about that, especially mm-hmm. if, especially if they like go on and win the title again and do the things that people expect them to do. Then I think that that's okay. You know, they're there are growing pains, you know, for every team and the thunder. I mean, if they, if they went to the finals in their first playoff run together, Man. can you imagine where expectations would be then? Like we talked yeah. about crushing expectations. <laughs> like the crushing expectations behind this team. If they went to the finals this season, like championship or bust for eternity now with this group, you know, as long as this group is together, if they don't win the title, it's going to be disappointing. It, you know, it, it would it would be like that. I mean, you know this from covering the team. I'm assuming in '09 when they won 50 games. I guess that wasn't '09. That was that first year they won. They were an eight seed yeah. and yeah. lost to the Lakers. That was that was 2010. Yeah, and that would be like if that team got to the finals, right? Like that that team was the first year that it was clearly you saw what this could be. And that was like, okay, you lost to the, the the reigning champs that was on their way to a second title. You know, it's okay. But getting to the finals would have been uh, ahead of schedule, right? Yeah. I mean, without a doubt. I don't, and that, it feels like the Thunder almost are, have skipped that year because this Thunder team just, they feel a little bit different. And the West was crazy that year. I mean, they won 50 games over eight. eight yep. I and mean, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a, crazy, crazy thing to think about because hardly anybody won 50 games last year in the Western Conference. So, but yeah, I mean, you think about what they did the year after that. So they went to the West Finals. You know, after they lost to the Lakers in round one, you know, they beat Nuggets, Grizzlies, and then were in the Conference Finals with the the Mavs who ended up winning the title. You know, this, and, that, and that's one thing I remember Thunder fans thinking of, saying it was like, oh, we lost to the eventual champions, you know, like twice in a row. Yeah. And and then, of course, they made the finals the next year. And then there's a lot to be told. <laughs> <after that. laughs> but I will say 
I, my expectations are still like round one, and then we'll see. Just because we we have a a coach that's never coached in the playoffs before. You have Shea, who's pl- he's been in the playoffs before, but not as the guy. And then what does Jalen Williams look like in the playoffs? What does Josh Giddy look like in the playoffs? You know, does Isaiah Joe shoot 28% in the playoffs? Like, I don't know. Yeah, that's something I've... I don't, it's not necessarily a narrative I've been pushing, but like I, I firmly believe you need playoff experience. You need to like, like fail a little bit in the playoffs before you can succeed. Mm-hmm. And I, it would be unprecedented to your point for them to make it to a finals in, like you said, skipping a year. Fine, they've they've got a ton of regular season success, but yeah, I, I think round two would be. I, I well, I could see them in the conference finals, depending on to your point about matchups. Um, but round two would be a success story. Last point about the the playoffs or last question. You said matchup dependent. If you had like the ideal first round matchup that you want, and then the one you don't want, who would it be? I mean, you, you said the Lakers, so I'm I'm assuming that's the team that I know they've given the Thunder problems this year. Yeah, I I don't really fear the Lakers as much, mostly because I've watched them other times and they're just not that good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, they're too real. They're really top heavy. Yeah, <laughs> they're very top heavy. They've played really good against the Thunder, which is why I like a lot of people. I mean, honestly, watching Phoenix, and I know Phoenix has like this like high ceiling, low floor thing going on. I think, given a seven game series, I think the Thunder would handle Phoenix. They they just seem to have a lot of problems. <clears throat> so I I think I would probably rather play Phoenix. Or the Pelicans, probably. And then teams to stay away from. I know the Clippers have been awful. And there's talk of them just not even getting along. Yeah. (laughs) In the background there. I don't know. I still wouldn't necessarily want to play a healthy Kawhi Leonard in the playoffs. I think that that's pretty scary. And then Dallas right now. I I don't know what to think. They're, They're a moving target. All the time, like they they looked awful, awful, you know, three weeks ago, and then now they're like, and is Dallas going to win the title? Is they going to, you know, so I don't, I don't even know what to think about them. But I think playing Luca and Kyrie with a, and they've been good defensively. That's going to be a tough, you know, out for anybody. So yeah, that to me would be the one to stay away from. You wonder with Dallas if it's like a second too late. Like, can you actually get to the finals as a six seed? Right. Um, my, my thought is they're a stone's throw from fifth or fourth. So, I yep. mean, the, the, the two very close wins that the, the Clippers just got against Philly and the magic might've saved them from yeah. potentially dropping out of home court in yep. the first round. But man, if, it's why the what if of a close in the, the margins of, of an NBA season, like if they drop to sixth, and the blueprint's kind of on the line in the first round, and like Lucas suddenly a four seed, you know, then the season gets the the playoffs can even get even more interesting. Um, you 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 mentioned the uh, reasons for the success this year. Obviously, an MVP candidate, a Rookie of the Year candidate, a Coach of the Year candidate, a Sixth Man of the Year candidate, and I'll go to J Dub and just say a Most Improved Player candidate. Yeah, sure. So with all of that as part of the blueprint, I I don't want to specifically like just go, okay, let's talk about the off season because of course there's a, a whole playoffs and a, all that to go through, but you have a ton of cap space. The, the Thunder have a ton of cap space and we have a, a couple of free agents that were just, just as Knicks fans, just a little worried might potentially get taken away. They're both CAA clients, which is why I'm not totally worried, but let, let's take Ananobi out of this. Cause I just, I don't personally see Ananobi that I just don't personally see that trade or or the the trade the Knicks made potentially leading to him leaving, right? Yeah, yeah. Isaiah Hartenstein is a free agent, and there is a cap on what the Knicks can pay him. Mm-hmm. The Thunder have been brought up as a team that might be interested. I uh, uh, theorize that having Chet in house and how the Thunder play, um, I don't think they would go all in on like throwing a bag at Isaiah Hartenstein. But maybe you can shed more light on this. Could Isaiah Hartenstein potentially be a target for the Thunder this offseason? Is a potential path to getting better in putting than Chet as like a full-time four, you know, and next to Hartenstein? The answer is no. No. Okay. So no. that's just like, we, Knicks fans don't be worried about the Thunder. 
No, I would not. The Thunder want a spacing five. And so you could argue, okay, you need to have different looks. You need to have like a bigger body in there. They're not going to do it for through, through free agency. Okay. If they're going to. And if they do, it's going to be, I don't know, mid-level or lower, you know. So, okay. And a backup big. They're not going to... The, the Chet is the starting center and will stay the starting center for this team. If they acquire a big, it will be a backup big. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think they could honestly fulfill that through the draft. So I could see them doing that more so through the draft. And then what they do with their cap space, they could do what they did last year is that they acquired Davis Berton so they could move up two spots. You know, I could see mm-hmm. them doing something like that. Or they could acquire a player who has, you know, a year left on their deal and some team needs to just like, please just take this from us so that we can go acquire. It could be Isaiah Hartenstein. I don't know. Um, and they'll do they'll do stuff like that with their cap space. I don't anticipate them going after free agents. One, they I mean they already have their rotation. I think that another thing that they that I would put on people's minds with the Thunder's cap space is they can make well one Josh Giddey's extension eligible. Not that that will take up their cap space until the next year, but that that's something that's on the table. And then Isaiah Joe and Aaron Wiggins can be made extension eligible to this summer. They can decline their options and give them extensions this summer. I would put that pretty high on the priority list. So I like Isaiah Hardenstein. I think that he would be helpful for this team. He's been obviously an amazing player and more of a defensive anchor than I would have ever thought he could be. I, I don't think the Thunder are the team to go after him though. So you can cross, you can cross them off the list. I okay. just, I just don't see it. All right. We're, we're growing that list by the way of teams I can cross off. Cause I'm just been going around until they just played the Raptors. I can cross them off. They just played the Spurs. I can cross them off. So yeah. the Thunder were absolutely one of those teams that there's, this is where scouring through the Twitterverse can yeah. sometimes be terrible. And you're just <laughs> like, Oh, that one tweet said that they're going to throw him a blank check. I need to be worried about the Thunder. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the Thunder just don't do free agency like that. You know, they haven't. One, they haven't don't really get the opportunity because I don't think players are like, man, you know where I'd love to go? You know where I'd love to live? Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. Get me there. Especially after like living in New York City and being a part of the Knicks. It's like, man, do I do I really want to I want to go there? Like that's where I want to live. You know, I I just I it's just not appealing. You know, as as a lifelong OKC resident, I can recognize that whenever I fly into different markets, I'm like, oh. This is an NBA city. Like this feels like an NBA city. You fly into Oklahoma City, you're like, that's it. You yeah. know. I mean, I I get it. Like I can I can handle that. It's 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 about basketball here. And I think I still think the Thunder want to keep this team young and build to the draft. So like somebody like Kyle Filipowski from Duke is probably more so somebody that will be on this team rather than a guy like Isaiah Hardenstein. So and how many picks do they have in this year's draft? They're really only going to have one. Okay. So they they've they've basically traded most of these, and then they had the the Jazz pick, but the Jazz it's top ten. It was top ten protected, and so they have mm. tanked their way into keeping that pick. And so the Thunder have kind of kicked the can down the road with a couple other picks at the end of the first round, and then have basically just kept this Rockets top four protected pick. In your opinion, because I have no idea how real this is, maybe you found more information than I did. But speaking of the Jazz, like the Laurie Marketing buzz that was there earlier in the season, I have no idea how available he is. I have no idea if Danny Ainge was just saying he's unavailable to drive the price up. I have no idea if the Thunder were looking at Laurie Marketing as a potential like add to their core. But like, would that be a move that like go get Laurie Markkinen? We've got our stretch four. We've got a, a another guy to put with with SGA and this core because he's pretty young too. And this is our team for the next however many years. Like, is that potentially something you could see them targeting? That was all fan created. Okay, I don't I don't think the team ever really considered something like that. The thing is, they're going to be very expensive soon because you have Shea on this max deal. Jalen Williams is definitely getting his max. Chet will get his max. 
Josh Giddy, I don't know what he'll get paid or what his extension looks like this summer, but it's probably going to be 20 million or more. And so you get expensive really fast with just your guys. And then it's like, what does Isaiah Joe get an extension? Cause he's pretty important to this team too. You know? So I, I think they are focused on how they can keep these guys together right now. And I know a lot of people, <clears throat> there's like two schools of thought with this. It's okay. How can we keep this together for a really long time? How do we focus on this group? Or it's, we have this small opportunity to have cap space, to be more flexible because these guys are younger and on rookie scale deals. How do we now use that cap space and kind of propel the team today? I don't know which is right or wrong, but I... I feel pretty confident in saying the Thunder are going to do the first option where I think that they're going to stay flexible with their cap space and with their payroll. Also knowing that like, Hey, we could be expensive for a while and let's not put the stress on our ownership group today. Yeah. Let's let it, let's let this thing grow, you know, more naturally and internally. We'll bring in guys when we need to, but, you know, they're second in net rating, like we talked about, one of the best teams in the Western Conference. I don't I don't think there's any um, need to push that. Now, if they were like sitting on the outside of the play in, you know, still fighting for a position and not really able to get over the hump, well then maybe they do something like that. But because they are where they are in the West, I think that they they feel pretty good about just kind of doubling down on where they're at. Well, the biggest credit I can give to Sam Presti, and I'll just like full disclosure, I've been critical of him in the past, but I just, I can't, I can't ignore the job that obviously he's done. And it's not even like, I got uh, there's been maybe some Knicks fans that have been on social media that have criticized the the tanking that may have potentially been going on. Yeah. Um, the, the beauty of what I think they've built here is like J dub was, I actually get them confused. It's Jay Will or Jay Dub is the one that's the most improved player candidate. Jay Dub, yeah. Jay Dub, okay. Remember so, Jay Will. So Jay Will is the big guy that likes to take charges. You can remember Jay Will take a charge. Ah, you know what? And Jay Dub helps them get a lot of dubs. Got it. So, dubs. so many dubs. Yes. Yeah, so they got him with the twelfth pick in the draft. That's not something you tanked for. SGA was just the Paul George trade becoming a complete win and like it's still I think from the Clippers perspective you know something they would do again I, I get it having having SGA become this you would have to really project yeah. but like what they've built wasn't necessarily 100% it wasn't full Sam Hinkie like we're tanking to the top they've actually been very selective about how they've built this team and found players in the margins and I, I, I commend the, what, the, what the Thunder have built there the Knicks lately have been a team that has been getting their flowers specifically with how they've built this team. They've traded one first round pick yeah. to acquire all these players and, and sign all these players. I get it. There's a CAA influence. Who am I to criticize a team for using their advantages to their, their benefit? Right. Um, but like you, you find a bargain contract with DiVincenzo and Hartenstein and Deuce McBride and my God, Jalen Brunson, and they've they've built a team that could potentially, you know, we'll see how far they can go in the East playoffs if they get healthy. Uh, I want to get your thoughts because I I like to pull the league. And maybe if people didn't catch the most recent episode of Cats and Shoot from a couple of weeks ago, uh, <laughs> they can get your thoughts here at Knicks Film School. Your thoughts on the Knicks, what they've built. And, you know, if, if we're being realistic about what their health situation is, what's their ceiling for a potential East playoff run? Yeah, I mean, it's been impressive. I mean, there's a lot of guys on this team that you're like, man, I didn't ever think they could be this. Uh, specifically, Jalen Brunson, who's been... see the best guard in the Eastern Conference right now? That's the conversation. Yeah, he's absolutely in that conversation now. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. I mean, I, I was I was talking to people in the uh, interview room at the uh, the Thunder facility last night where I, was, I had the game on, the Spurs-Knicks game on, and I'm like, man... Jalen Brunson going to beat Mel's record here, and it, I thought for sure heading into overtime that, that mm -hmm. he was going to do it, and then he wasn't able to get there. But yeah, I, I mean, I think the ceiling is East Finals is not impossible. Now, 
God, the Bucks are so confusing. Cause like one minute you're like, man, the Bucks are, and they look like they're ready to be in the finals again. And then the next you're like, God, like they're going to go out in round one again. <laughs> I, I, you know, just depending on what you're watching, I don't know. But I think the, the defense, I think Brunson is going to be amazing in the playoffs. Dante DiVincenzo is like one of probably the one, a storyline that has continued to kind of go under the radar a little bit. Cause that guy's, he had like a, a Lynn Sanity month, you know, I, I don't know. That guy's awesome. And then I guess it's really just like, what's Randall's status? Cause I think that's, I mean, that's going to be a big deal for them. Yeah. What, what, what is, what is his status? What's he's not even taking contact at the moment. And I think, so I agree the their chances against the Celtics and maybe even against the Bucks kind of yeah. depend on what Julius Randall is. Yeah. Where it actually relates to this matchup on Sunday night against the the Thunder is the Ananobi status. Cause yeah. look, Jalen Brunson's been great. And as someone like behind this this hoodie right here is a Carmelo Anthony jersey. And like I'm I'm this Knicks film school like self-proclaimed mellow stan where I just like unnecessarily sometimes try to defend uh his tenure in New York. But like I recognize that what Jalen Brunson has done has been amazing. They've largely like they're two games over 500 without Ananobi this year where the margin or where they've taken the leap is that they're 15 and two that in games that Ananobi has played. Yeah. So I think that's actually the injury that I'm concerned about. And yeah. look, I we've circled this game, this Easter Sunday game as if he misses this one, then I'm worried because he went out with an elbow injury during this road trip five games ago or seven games ago. No, six games ago. And they were the Knicks basically at first were like, oh, yeah, it's just he's coming back from surgery. He's just he's just he's sore. It's OK. And then he played another game against the Kings and then missed the next six. And it's like, OK, I get it. Lesser opponents. You're, you're keeping him out against the two, the four lottery teams. <laughs> now they're playing the Thunder. If he misses yeah. this, then it's no longer you can make the argument. They're just keeping him out for for lesser competition. Now he's actually missing games that you probably need him to win, you know? Yeah. What was the last update on him? It's elbow management, right? Elbow injury management. It's like, it's a bone spur. Like he got his elbow clean, so he can't re-injure like what was hurt, what was hurting before. You can't re-injure bone spurs. You remove them. Yeah. But like, maybe it's tendonitis. Maybe like I, I've I've actually not heard the the it's a, it's the Knicks too, so you don't know the clarification. Like yeah. they could tell me tomorrow we have amputated OG Ananobi's arm, and it's like oh, so that was the injury this whole time, and it's like yeah, yep, that's the Knicks that he's day to day, but it's actually worse than it actually is. So let's talk about this game on Sunday in the context of he's gonna play, and then how he's if he's not gonna play. I don't think I just I, the Knicks will have a, a hard time winning this game. I think if if Ananobi doesn't play. Um, you going into this matchup, let's assume he does. Like, how, how confident do you, do you think the Thunder should be? How confident do you think the Knicks should be? What, what, how do you see a game like that potentially playing out if the Knicks have Ananobi? So, so some of this will depend on if Shea Gillis Alexander plays. That's he's the other out. variable. You're right. You're right. Uh, so he's been out the past two games. They looked really good without him last night, but they also just shot the ball so well. I, I think, yeah, those, those two variables will be huge. I think Shea has a good chance of playing. He was out warming up last night on the court. It's a thigh contusion that he's been kind of working through. And he got it against the Jazz last week and kind of tried to play through it and wasn't able to kind of stop and start like he had been. And so that will be... I think if Shea plays, I think the Thunder will feel pretty confident either way. Just because I think getting Shea some rest, I think he he kind of needed it. He had, he'd been beat up even beyond just the thigh. But I would say that the Thunder will feel confident either way, whether, whether OG plays or not, if Shea's in the lineup. Now, if Shea's not in the lineup, you don't really know what you're going to get. You, know, you could have a great shooting night like they did against Phoenix, where they just blew him out, or they didn't play very well against Houston. They kind of got it together toward the end of the game, but it was overall a pretty ugly game for them. So they'll be hit or miss without Shea. Uh, so to me, that probably is a bigger variable 
for me with the the confidence that the Thunder feel rather than OG. Obviously, OG helps a lot, but just having you know multiple weapons, Shea, J Dub, and Chet, you know, offensively, I think they feel pretty good about their matchup with almost anybody. If no Shea, who are they putting on Brunson? Um, Dort. Dort. Ah, that makes sense. Dort, Dort, Dort the point no attack. What. Yeah, okay. Dort, no matter what. Yeah. Both kind I, of stocky, compact guys. And yeah. So sure. if Shea and Dort play, how, I mean, just to project a little bit, where, how good of a night you think Jalen Brunson has potentially having to face to, you know, like you said, stocky guards that, I mean, right now there has, like, he was going to one on one against Wemby last night at points. And it was like, oh, okay, so it doesn't matter if you're like s- extremely tall, he's still going to find a way to get, get <laughs> something at the rim, you know? Yeah. I mean, watching Jalen Brunson lately, it, I mean, he's a star. So it doesn't, I mean, you're not going to shut him down. You know, you can, you can slow him, but, but also like the shooting that the Knicks have on the wing. Especially if Deuce McBride just like is JJ Reddick now. Like I don't really even know what to think. But neither do we, Andrew. <laughs> neither do we. <laughs> I, I think. I mean, who's who's to say he can't get forty on Sunday? Because I mean, who's been able to stop him? I mean, so I mean, I think Dort and Case and Wallace, and even J Dub are are all three good options for him. But I don't know. I mean, I. He he defies a lot of logic lately. So I'll, yeah, I mean, I I don't think that you can stop him. I think that you have to limit other players on the team, you know, and you have to you have to have good closeouts. And the Thunder, this is an interesting thing with the Thunder is like their their defense. They really sell out to pack the paint and sell out to keep guys from getting to the hoop. And they their opponents actually shoot the most corner threes in the league this season. And so when you watch the thunder, you know, pretty quickly whether their defense is on point or not on how they're, what they're scrambling looks like to the corners. And so that'll be something to watch for. If we we've seen them particularly on Sunday afternoon ish games where they just are not great (laughs) at kind of scrambling to the corners. And so that'll be, that's like the first thing I'm looking for in games. A lot of times like what is their defense sharp? If it's not, it could be a long night. Because, I mean, they've, they've lost to Detroit, you know, on, on an afternoon, Sunday afternoon game because they're, they were just leaving the corners wide open. So some, that, that is something to watch for. So a lot of Knicks fans will hear that and recognize a similar strategy, specifically in a Tom Thibodeau defense that, like, you try to take something away, you try to take away the rim, and you trust the variance of three-point shooting. And last night against the not so great three point shooting team like the Spurs, the the Knicks unfortunately got bit. And to your point about you, you'd know right away by the scrambling, just the lackluster efforts from Josh Hart, from my gosh, Boyan Bogdanovich, but even like Deuce McBride, and just as a team, they were a step slow getting. I don't know if it was just like they saw what the Raptors put out there on Wednesday, and the Knicks won by forty five. Yeah. I was like, oh, we can kind of coast against these teams, right? And then a, a well-coached team like... And that's not trying to be disrespectful to Darko, but like what Pop clearly told them was like, off misses, get out and run, and we'll find open shots. And they just hit a ton last night. Um, I am curious... Honestly, the exact same scenario. If the Knicks pack the paint strategy, and if the Thunder are hitting threes, is that just... I mean, especially the fact that they've just struggled, struggled against stretch fives. All season. Poor Zingius has killed them. Brooke Lopez, like the first good game he had this year from three was against the Knicks. Mm-hmm. So I'll be I'll be curious to see if Chet has a good game. And obviously the last time the Knicks played the Thunder, Jay Will, excuse me, Jay Dub had a good game. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know it's 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 a, it's a game both teams need. And I'll be curious how healthy if we get a, a, at least some semblance of health, uh, how how both teams potentially play. Um, so two questions before I let you get out of here. The first one, your unbiased MVP ballot and a, a, a small follow up. How high, how, how many names do you get before you say Jalen Brunson? So your unbiased ballot and where does Jalen Brunson fall? If we kept the, mm-hmm. and, unless he's five, you know, maybe he's, he's fifth on your list, but what would your ballot be today? Yeah, I think, I think Jokic is number one. I would put Shay number two. 
Uh, let's see. I, and this I don't know if this is a hot take or not. I think what Giannis has been able to do this season with the Bucks to kind of hold everything together as they're changing coaches and the roster is overturned a little bit. And I think he's been unbelievable. So mm-hmm. he's my third. I'd say Luca fourth. He's been crazy. I mean, the stats alone just like scream MVP. So I'll put Luca there. I think, he, I think you can put Brunson in the conversation at this point. Honestly, you know, Embiid would have been in here if he would have stayed healthy for sure. I think Jason Tatum is in this conversation, obviously. I probably put Tatum here. And then who am I missing? I, I don't know who to exactly give the Timberwolves when they deserve some credit. I think it's probably Ant. I mean, Ant definitely lately, mm-hmm. but maybe not for the full season. Who else, who else am I missing? So there's Kawhi, if you wanted to make an argument for him. Um, yeah. I know Halliburton got some love earlier in the year. Right. Um, that yeah, The small. reason I'm more, more asking this is because of, I know this is competition, but the, the MVP ladder that was submitted yeah. by a potential worldwide leader. And um, I, Dale Brunson is not in the top 10. So I'm glad that we're at six names and you're like, oh, like Jalen Brunson should probably be at this point. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. Is it just that his status as like a star, like he's still kind of establishing that? I don't know. Like, I don't know why. I don't know how you could watch this season and have him outside your top 10. I, I, the words you just, the three words you just said are, are my response. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know how you don't put him in the top six, at least. I'm fine if like, team wins 60 plus games you put an MVP candidate on there Mm -hmm. and to your point like if you wanted to say the the Timberwolves need someone in the top six or seven fine they've won 60 plus they're gonna win 50 plus games that's fine yeah Jalen Brunson just he's one he's arguably one of the three or four best offensive players in the sport this year Mm -hmm. and it's not as this may be some haterade but it's not like through a pyramid scheme, like what's going on in Indiana, where I'm pretty sure you or I could probably get like three assists in that <laughs> offense. Um, but I, I I think what he's done and the base level of like the floor that the Knicks are with with him here. Now, granted, I think their leap will be when you get Anobi back and you surround him with some pretty dominant defensive players. But yeah, I he would be sixth or seventh on my projected unbiased ballot my biased ballot is like Luca get out of here. And he's like fourth or fifth, but um, I'm glad to hear someone whose opinion I trust also put him in the the top six conversation, you know? Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a great player. I think he has been the best guard in the Eastern conference. And like, how do you not put him at least in your top 10? I I mean, I mean, if I sat down and wrote it out, he would probably be anywhere from six to eight for me. Knicks fans, you heard it here first. We've got another Andrew that believes Jalen Brunson should be in the top six to eight in MVP. Right, Andrew year. Pod. Yes, shout out to the Andrew Pod. Last question before I let you get out of here. I do this with every guest on the pregame pod, the Mount Rushmore of rivals. We take our rivalries here seriously here in New York, you mm-hmm. know? So um, the four teams that you think Thunder fans or even just you in particular look forward to playing on the NBA schedule. Um, the, the four teams maybe historically that have just generated juice when they're in the building or whether the Thunder go to their building, the Mount Rushmore arrivals for the Thunder, who would they be? Golden State Warriors, number one. Okay. There's obvious juice there f- because of playoff matchups and then the whole Kevin Durant saga and everything there. Fans were still booing Kevin Durant last night. Uh, really? Which I appreciate. Any cupcakes? No cupcakes, no cupcakes. They've dialed it down a little bit, but they do boo him every time he touches the ball. So I respect it. Some people are like, it's time to move on. I'm like, listen, people boo because they cared so much about that era. Like, that's why they boo. You know, and what they're show, what they're telling you is that era still matters to me. What he did in Oklahoma City still matters to me. Don't go soft. Keep booing him, everybody. Um, <laughs> I think next is probably Houston. They've matched up several times in the playoffs. 
they have had multiple trades that have created this uh, vitriol between the two fan bases. First one's the James Harden trade. The next one is the Thunder traded on draft night, Alperin Shengun to the Rockets for two future first round picks, which the Knicks now own. Um, so like there, that exists too. And so in this one, maybe more online than it is anything else. But I just know that my life is going to be like 13% worse when we play the Rockets, um, especially if they lose to the Rockets. You didn't even say the rust trade. My goodness. Oh, the rust trade too. Yeah. yeah. That was, a, I mean, that's a win for the Thunder. Like that, that, I mean, even though you're trading the probably one guy that is for sure going to get a statue outside of the arena in Oklahoma City, um, that was, it was good timing. <laughs> if you're going to make a trade like that, that's the way to, way to do it to, yeah. to get yeah. what they got back. Uh, all right. Yeah. So who are the two others? Uh, San Antonio. There's, I mean, they've played a lot in the playoffs in the past. And then you have the Wimby Chet thing that the mm-hmm. NBA is going to force us. They're going to force us to want. So that's definitely there. And then Memphis. The Thunder have had multiple playoff series with the Grizzlies that have gone like multiple overtimes. And like the, it's a little dormant right now just with the status of the Grizzlies. But John Morant comes back next season. They're kind of this revamped Grizzlies team that I think are going to be really good next year. And I think that rivalry could be renewed. Uh, sometime next year. So uh, that's that's probably it. I'm trying to think if I overlook somebody. I don't. Think so. my, my only thought would be if the Lakers ended up on there. Um, just from, I mean, look, the it may be LeBron generated because of 20, 2012, but yeah, um, I don't. Probably not so much with the Lakers. I mean, they they played them in that 2010 series and lost in six, and then they played them again in 2012 and beat them at kind of the end of like the Kobe, Andrew Bynum, Pau Gasol era. So probably not so much of a, it doesn't really feel like a, a rivalry. Also Dallas should feel like a rivalry because they have also played the Mavs in the playoffs and lost and won series against them. But there's no animosity between those two teams at yeah. all. So, which could be created this year if they play I and mean, they could play in a three, six matchup, which I think, we they could definitely supplant somebody like Memphis as, well, as soon as April. For whatever it's worth, I just did a Spurs pregame pod, and the Thunder were one of the first names mentioned. A lot of wow, a lot of, a lot of Spurs right, matchups when you look through it. The yeah. where, oh, yeah. where both teams got a got one on the other each time. So that's mm-hmm. that's probably I figured that's the name that would come up. And who knows if this the Chet Wemby era that the NBA yep. might force will at least lead to another chapter in yep. said rivalry. Uh, Andrew, I love doing pods with someone with a great name and obviously I'm a bit biased, but uh, it was good to do a pod with you. Obviously following your your work for a while, it was good to finally get you here. Before you get out of here, please have let the fine folks at home know where they can find you and all of your stuff. Yeah, go listen to the Athletic NBA show. I'd appreciate that. And go listen to Down to Dunk. If you are into Thunder content. So, yeah. There you go. Thank you, Andrew, for joining me. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in for another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. If you dig the show, please head over to iTunes, drop a five-star rating and a review. If you liked this video, please do so by actually liking this video. And remember to subscribe. I will be back Tuesday morning to preview another matchup. Speaking of rivalries, against the Miami Heat. Hopefully nobody on the Knicks gets injured in this matchup. But until next time, thank you for listening. Enjoy the game tonight. Happy Easter. And I'll speak with you soon. Peace.